Lloyd with Morgan streaking. She's checking the goalkeeper. The pay disparity between the men and women is, is just too large and, and we want to continue to fight. Uh, the generation of players before us fought and now it's our job to, to keep on fighting. The pay cap for the women's Major League Soccer players is 11 times less than the pay cap for men's Major League Soccer. 11 times. Rapino gets across it. It's towards one. We're listening to Give and Go with Rotas Wadera, only on Girls Soccer Network. Hello and welcome. This is episode 35 of Give and Go. I am your host, Rotas Wadera. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to us at Girls Soccer Network. It has been a little while. We apologize for the delay in content, but we are happy to be back. There's been a lot going on, but we are sure to be bringing you more podcast content on a consistent basis. With that being said, all the latest and greatest news regarding the world of women's sports, go to www.girlssoccernetwork.com. Check us out on Instagram at Girls Soccer Network. Check us out on Twitter at Girls Soccer Net. We have a YouTube channel as well where on all avenues of social media, we post different tips and tricks for how you can improve your game so be sure to check all of that good stuff out along with other articles lifestyle news etc on top of that if you want to listen to this podcast more specifically you can just tell siri to do it for you all you have to do is tell siri i want to listen to this specific episode i want to subscribe to this episode Whatever you want to do, Apple Podcasts is the best way to do that. Of course, we are on other avenues as well, whether it's Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, whatever it is, we are on a wide variety of formats. You can get this episode from many different avenues, Stitcher as well. All right, now that that's out of the way, before we get into the soccer talk, I wanted to be sure to touch on a very important topic, and that is, of course, that black lives still matter. We all have to keep fighting. We all have to continue to do our part. It does not matter who or where you come from. We all have a part to play in this. Whether it's making the phone calls, whether it is donating. If you have the means to donate money, please donate. Okay, Sign petitions. Do whatever it is that you need to do. But the situation is dire right now, guys. We need all the help we can get. So continue to do your part, okay? The fight is not over. There might have been a small point where things kind of lulled down for a bit. People's social media feeds went started to go back to normal. And then again, we have another situation where an unarmed black man has to lose their life. And why? Not just black men, black women, trans people, everyone. I'm not just trying to, like, everyone. I'm trying to get this through to everyone listening. Like, we all need to do more. We need to continue to do more. Okay. And on top of that, we have the loss. Rest in peace, Chadwick Bozeman. Rest in peace. You know, that was such a hard loss um, for a lot of people to have him and Kobe in the same year. So, again, we're all going through right now. Stay strong. Okay. We are here in this fight together. We are here together. And we need to continue to fight together. All right, now we can get into the nitty-gritty, the soccer. There has been a lot to come back, right? Obviously, the NWSL set the stage for coming back, but now we're getting back to fall, right? It's it's fall season now, and it's going to be a little different than what I think we're all used to, right? Like, especially when you think about, for me, who's been so far removed from my playing career, fall is just that nostalgic feeling of soccer season, Like, you know, whether it's for school, whether it's for club, you know you're getting ready to lace those cleats up. Again, whether you put the goalkeeper gloves on or not, it's up to you. But it gives you that certain feeling like, hey, school is back, soccer is back. But it's a little different now, right? Especially at the college level. And that's one of the first things we wanted to update you guys on this episode is what is happening with college sports. Because there is a lot, a lot of updates to bring to you. The main thing here is that Player safety is of the utmost importance, right? We need to keep as many people safe as we can keep, not just players, but everyone involved on the staff, the people organizing the games, right? But I think you'll notice pretty much everyone except for three major conferences have postponed their play, 
right? And and there's a reason for that. The three conferences that will continue to press on, it appears, are the ACC, the SEC, and the Big 12. Now, you think about where they are geographically located. They're in areas where populations are not as dense. Like So there's less likely of there being an opportunity to contract the virus. With that being said, is that still, are we still being as safe as we can possibly be? I don't know. But it would likely explain why ACC is kind of like East Coast, South. You know, Big 12 is the Midwest, SEC is the South. So you're looking at, right, these three conferences stand to make quite a bit of money as well. You can't underestimate that fact. Like colleges are trying to find a way to make up what they can make up because colleges are a big business in this country. But you look at the SEC, the Big 12, and the ACC, right? They are all going to play conference-only regular season games followed by a conference championship. So the SEC is going to have an eight-match conference-only season with the SEC championship being played towards mid to late November. The Big 12 is going to have a nine-game conference schedule starting on September 11th. So again, no non-conference matchups. Teams are not going to be traveling, right? So everything is going to be kept as geographically close as it can possibly be kept. So as I mentioned, the Big 12 is going to do a nine-game conference season. The SEC is going to do an eight-game conference season. And the ACC is going to do a six-game conference season, again, with an ACC championship. Because again, There's TV money here, right? The the SEC has their own network. The Big 12 has their own TV network. And the ACC, all in collaboration with ESPN. So there's money there, and it just makes sense. And you think about the star power. I mean, who wouldn't want to see ACC play? Like, the ACC is the premier conference. North Carolina, you got star players like Brianna Pinto and Alessia Russo coming back for another year. It's a stacked class of players. And, And I think that's the other interesting decision here. What do you do if you're a star player? Do you want to sit out this year in the hopes of getting ready for the pros? If you are on that level, like if you're Katarina Macario at Stanford, what do you do? Right, Because the Pac-12 is not going to be back. Right, The Pac-12 has seemed to postpone. And they're still waiting on word on how much they're actually going to play. So if you're Katarina Macario, what do you do? Right, Do you wait it out or do you really just lock in and get ready. There's so many decisions that are going into the lives of these collegiate athletes. A lot to think about, 110%. But that's the main update in the college game. So we will have the ACC, SEC, and Big 12 going on as scheduled. Everyone else has postponed play indefinitely until more will be known within the coming days and coming weeks as, as the fall season kind of progresses. We just focused on the college game. Now we will shift over to the club scene. We've got a big update there and a very exclusive interview with Jen Winnegal, the commissioner of the ECNL, updating us on what is to come on the club landscape. Here it is, guys. Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Where did your soccer journey begin and how did it culminate in you becoming the commissioner of the ECNL? Sure. First, thank you, Rotas, for having me on and Girls Doctor Network. Excited to be here and just share a little bit of my perspective on my beginnings and also what my role is here at the ECNL. Uh, my soccer journey began at about four years old uh, in Northern Virginia. I grew up in Woodbridge. My parents don't come from a soccer background. They actually, I think between the two of them, played probably every other sport but soccer, but they were firm believers in letting uh, me and my siblings try a little bit of everything to see where we landed. Also, fun fact, I'm a triplet. I have a brother and a sister, so instant playmates, best friends growing up, and that was another driver for my parents to, one, keep us active, and two, socializing with other children, which was really fun. So definitely an interesting background growing up with two of them, and soccer stuff for all three of us. And early on, um, our competitive edge and nature came out, which really led us to continue to grow within the sport. My sister and I joined our first travel team at about eight years old, the Prince William Sparklers, and the name is everything. <laughs> it, it would stay with us for about 10 years throughout our entire youth career and uh, became somewhat notorious in the youth landscape. I was coached by Ken Krieger for all 10 years, and I believe 10 of us would play the entire decade with him. Um, it was a remarkable team. 
we were wired the same way in kind of a perfect storm of competitiveness and us really eager to learn and, and grow together. That led me into an opportunity to play collegially at Virginia Commonwealth University here in Richmond, Virginia. Helped make program history with two appearances in the NCAA. Really grew a lot as a player and a leader during this time. Just under a tutelage of brand new coaches, playing with players that were international and, you know, just youth enemies at the time. And it was just eye-opening for me, having grown up with a core group of players and the same coach the entire, my entire youth career. Going into college, uh, I was really stretched and challenged, and um, it was was eye-opening for me. A year after graduating, I accepted a coaching position as the assistant coach at the University of Richmond where I spent five seasons, here is where I really saw a big shift in like my personal lens from going from player to coach and looking at the game differently. It was just amazing how I could learn from the game that I had played my entire <laughs> my entire life, digested and turn it into teaching moments and really the perspective and way, uh, I guess the tone of how you um, express that to players. It's challenging. I was a young assistant coach, but, you know, really emerged as a leader and saw the the game in a different way and knew that I wanted to be around it and to learn from it and to give back. That was the first time I really think I wanted to play an active role in giving back. And also, at my time with U of R, I was able to see ECNL from the start. Um, From a college recruiting perspective, I saw the ECNL as, like, divisions within major tournaments and really... Being like, what is what is this? What's this new league? What's it about? And and how is this now entering the scene? And, and what's next? So through those years, I really just continuing to evolve in the U.S. And I, you know, I felt like I played a, a part of raising the game. I just didn't know it yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I reached a point where I was just ready for another challenge and decided to move into a more administrative role uh, back in my alma mater in donor relations. And I was eager to learn. I wanted to, to learn more about the ins and outs of like the business perspective around athletics and to really, again, following that passion of giving back. And I focused on that piece of it, giving back, building relationships and learning, just trying to be a sponge. After about two years at VCU, I was approached by the former commissioner here at VCNL to come join the team and I took a leap of faith. It was too good not too intriguing and too good not to be a part of a league that had grown. It was only five years old at the time. And I started my career here at the ECNL as the member services manager and a year and a half later took on my current role and haven't looked back. And it's really, it's been a little over six years in total now with the ECNL and the league has expanded so much and we're not stopping. So I think it's been a a wild journey, but soccer is the one constant within it. And again, just that drive to really give back to others around the sport. I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that um, and to stay around it, and I want to continue to do that through the ECNL and the offerings here. So here I am, six years later. Mm -hmm. And you talked about this kind of natural progression from player to coach to now commissioner. What is kind of, I guess, one major takeaway you've had from all of those experiences leading up to where you currently are now? Yeah, uh, my takeaways are just, I mean, my brain goes towards I'm a lifelong learner. I fell in love with the game early on and wanted to compete and be the best at it that I possibly could be, not really knowing at the time that it would lead me to a college career and coaching and, and other opportunities and really just growing. <laughs> and so I, I think I just go back towards growing and being a lifelong learner has been the takeaway. And I certainly see that every day here at the ECNL as we continue to grow and provide um, a platform for the, the growth and players, the level of player, and the level of player nationwide, really. So I think that that's really important is continuing to evolve with the game and meet the needs that the game demands and needs. And, then you, and you definitely, you mentioned growth and Tell us more about how the league has steadily grown because, like as you mentioned, it was small before. Now you have more than 100 clubs, six national events, eight total conferences. There's so much that, that this has developed into. Sure. Um, and really, the, the evolution of the ECNL, and I know I've, I've said growth and evolved quite a bit so far, it's, it's dependent on the game and the level of play. And that 
it goes hand in hand. So as the, the growth and like the pool of players across the country, the talent of that pool of players has elevated. And with that, the demand for the game and the, the experience is there. And that's where the UCNL has entered in. So continue to evolve with the environment and offer it not just for quantity, it's for what the game needs and to continue to provide a platform to develop these players is our mission. And I guess going back from five years ago, it was, I think we were about 76 member clubs and just on the girls' side. And now, six years later, the girls have evolved to, we now have 113 clubs at the ECNL level. And we now have an ECNL regional league platform that's entering its second full season that has expanded. It's more than, it's about doubled from last year. And that, again, goes back to the deeper player pool, the, the level of talent of the youth player across the country. And a third, the ability to roll out this platform for the ECNL boys on the boys' side in the boys' youth game has been integral and um, a big part of that the fast track, if you will, for the boys has been the, the roots and the experience that the ECL girls have had and where we continue to go, and, and we see that need on the boys' side as well. Okay, and what does the the regional league, what does it specifically provide for, for this deeper pool of players, and has it been difficult now to manage with everything going on in terms of COVID? The regional league is the proving ground. Again, um, as I talk about this deeper pool of players and the talent level increasing across the country and in different regions, the regional league really provides a platform where we can continue to offer opportunities to a larger group of players. And there is an opportunity to progress and qualify into the ECL Open Cup in the postseason where we are having ECL and ECL Regional League teams that qualify, they have an opportunity to compete with or more so against each other. And that, again, leads to development of the game. So as more players are getting the opportunity to participate with and against each other, there's the carrot at the end. Like There's this opportunity to play with and against some of the top players across the country. So the regional league is really providing the ECNL structure and the platform to a broader audience to help in those like different regions and conferences across the country that have a deeper pool and to provide opportunities. And again, there is a pathway into the ECNL girls. And how difficult has it been managing with this current pandemic situation in terms of not just operations in the day-to-day, but then there's also coaches and players, I'm sure, constant questions, constant information gathering in terms of how the situation is being monitored and handled. So how, how have you guys been able to deal with that? Sure. Uh, there's one thing that the ECNL knows and knows well is, the, is expansion and evolving with the game, with, again, following our mission to raise it and to offer opportunities and to, to again, progress development within the game itself. That was happening well before COVID. So, again, it's, it's not something that's new to us. And, I, you know, COVID's not over. That's, that's reality. But our expansion has continued. We're looking forward to this current season, the 12th season for the girls, the fourth season for the boys. And at this time, we want to provide resources while we continue to work towards returning to play nationwide. We have different conferences kicked off last weekend. We have other conferences kicking off this weekend. Again, it varies due to restrictions and, and everything that's going on with the uh, pandemic. But we're excited. We're, we're business as usual and looking forward to, again, safely returning to the field. And that means something different across the country in different regions. So you would say there's more specific pockets where you're already coming back to play and then other places where eventually you'd like to be back nationally, like fully in operation. Correct. And we're creating environments for kids to play in in the safest and healthiest way possible. And we recognize that there are challenges for some communities that others don't won't face or won't face currently. And we're prepared to adjust and work with the differences that different regions, communities, clubs are facing to assist our membership as needed. That's something that we're preparing to do. We're continuing the conversation 
and we're ready to make those adjustments as they come up. Okay, and lastly, what is your message to all of the girls out there who are looking to play college soccer and have had their season either canceled, postponed, pushed back due to the pandemic? Sure. Everyone is experiencing obstacles, including college coaches, fellow teammates, players across the country, referees, parents, fans. But, so ultimately, it is up to you to follow your passion. You cannot control what is going on, but you can control what you do and how you, you do it. In fact, that's something that I've heard from our newly appointed East Dale Mental Performance Advisor, Dr. Christina Fink, that there are going to be things that you can't control and you can control the things that you can. So being proactive, using your resources, you can control your future. That's what I would advise. Again, it was great to have Jen on the podcast. Incredibly well-spoken, incredibly driven, and clearly has a vision, an idea for where she wants to take the girls' game at the club level, right? Raise the game is the moniker, the motto that the company has set, and and that's clearly something they're intent on doing. They're already ahead of the game. It almost seemed impossible. It didn't seem like it would be a thing to have games this early, yet they are making it possible. Of course, they're making sure everyone is safe, right? But it clearly seems like an adjustment has been made and And as, again, coronavirus restrictions will slowly get lifted, if people will do their part, we will start to get to a place where nationally we will be able to get back to the way things were, where, again, players can now be back in the showcases and be seen by college coaches and and get to that level that they want to get to. So if you are an ECNL player, I'm sure that's a great update to be getting to know that there will be an opportunity to return, if not now, then for sure in the springs, it seems. So great update. Um, again, we wanted to thank Jen for joining us on the podcast. It was a, it was great to have her as a guest. Okay, now we've gone from the college game to the club game. We shift to the pros. The NWSL again is back. Who would have thought this soon we'd be getting a fall series, but that is what is going to be the case. The NWSL again on top of it in terms of their organization, their planning. Here's how it's going to play out. We have three pods. Now, this is a system that I think baseball should have switched to a long time ago because then you wouldn't have had the coronavirus cases that they were having. They were at any risk of having an end the entire season. But how the pod system is going to work, 18 matches over the course of seven weeks featuring three three three-team pods. Teams within each pod will play one another to enable the league to minimize travel. The full format and schedule will be coming out soon, but the point is these teams are only going to play these teams, so I guess it's going to be tough to kind of crown a winner at the end of the day, like who will be the official winner, but it'll just be, I think, kind of just a way for us to enjoy and see more NWSL soccer. So the West Pod is going to be the Rain the Thorns, and the Royals of Utah. That's a very tough pod right there, right off the bat. You're going to get some very intense games in in that. The Northeast, Chicago, Sky Blue, and the Spirit. Now, again, normally I'd say, based on how the Challenge Cup went, again, this is going to be a really great pod. Sky Blue on the rise, Chicago, you know, got it together in the playoffs, but then again, couldn't finish the job. The Spirit, again, now no longer have Rose Lavelle. So now we see how they rebuild. Where do they go from here? West, Northeast, and finally the South. The Courage, the Pride, and the Dash. So Crystal Dunn is headed to Portland. So with Sam is gone and Crystal Dunn likely gone, where do the Courage go from here? How good are they really going to be? Of course, they're going to be among the top teams. Of course, they're going to be amongst the elite. They signed Dabinia to a huge contract, which is great for her. And so the South pod is going to be fun between the Courage and the Dash, two teams that are among the top because the Dash just proved it with the Challenge Cup win. The Pride obviously still have a lot of work to do. They're going to have a tough time going up against the Courage and the Dash. So that's going to be a fun pod. Again, we're already... You know, one week away, I believe Megan Rapino and Kelly O'Hara are already out 
of this fall season, and I don't think that should come as a surprise to many people. Megan has been proudly supporting Sue Bird with what the WNBA has been doing over in the in their bubble down in Bradenton, Florida. So I don't don't expect to see Megan Rapinoe back on the field anytime soon. And then on top of that, you have Kelly O'Hara, who I think is is just gonna again take some time off with the injuries that she's had. Just take this time to heal and rest up. But there's also other players who have decided to take this time to go abroad, right? And this is, I think, as good a time as any amid the pandemic, again, as long as it's safe. But players have every right and opportunity to go seek a new experience in order to better their playing careers. Emily Boyd, who we've worked with, obviously she has her eBoyd's food account that we love to follow. She has been the backup in Chicago for quite some time. She's heading out to Denmark, and that will be a tremendous experience for her. Anytime you send a younger player out on loan with an opportunity to grow, getting that international experience will be fantastic. So I think that's a great way to get her ready for when you feel that Alyssa Nair is not going to be the number one. Obviously, that's still some time, but you got to start looking ahead right to the future. Jessica Fishlock, who is back will be going to Reading FC. Now, Reading is a solid team over in England, and I think she provides uh, more veteran leadership. I'm I'm not entirely sure if Farrah Williams is still there, but Reading will be a fun team to watch for as long as Jess Fishlock is going to be one of the leaders in the locker room. Emily Sonnet is headed to Sweden, play for Gothenburg FC. I hope I pronounced that okay. That's the same team that Kristen Press has gone to play for. I'm sure she reached out to Kristen and got some type of some type of knowledge on what that experience is like. And so she's going to be there till November. So again, more star players still deciding whether they want to be in or out. But the point is, is that with this, it'll give more players, new players, an opportunity to show what they're worth. And that is what brings us to another very special interview. Jennifer Cujo, one of the breakout stars of the NWSL Challenge Cup. First of all, she has just signed a permanent deal with Sky Blue, a multi-year deal, an official contract offer. We want to congratulate you, Jennifer That is amazing because you're talking about all that hard work that you put in culminating to this, to getting stability, to getting a permanent deal that keeps you at the club for a set period of time. You've done it. And so without further ado, we won't keep you guys waiting. A very special interview with Jennifer Cujo of Sky Blue FC. Enjoy, guys. Jennifer, it's it's been a little while since the NWSL Challenge Cup ended. What have you been up yeah. to? What have What have you been up to since then? And and what's some of the work that you've been putting in? I think I've been training and pretty much been training and keeping up with you know just not just like sitting home. Pretty much working on things that I I need to work on and get better. And so pretty much I'm just training and all that and looking forward to the future. So for that one, I can't say much about it yet, but I think pretty soon, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Just getting ready. Gotcha. And when did you first decide it was your dream to play professional soccer in America? I think if I, I, I think I would say when I was thirteen. Even though, like, I love the game growing up where I'm from, and it's a real competitive sport, and you know, you don't know exactly what you're doing until you get to a point where you feel like this is actually what you. So for me, growing up, I've loved the game so much, and I think at that age, I know that this is what I really want to do, and I told my sister that, hey, this is what I want to do, I'll come to America, play, go to college, and hopefully I can see my inspiration, which is on this Morgan and all that, and my role model, which is Ricardo Kaka, so I had that dream, and I think that's what kept me going, and never give up, and keep, you know, pushing, and going through, you know, a whole lot of things to get here. So I think at that age, I would say that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, what is it about Kaka that made him your idol? What about him inspired you? Well, Kaka uh, is just every time I see him play, I can see myself through him, the way he plays. And, you know, I think I have certain similarities towards him. And it's not like oh, he will score and then sometimes he will create and that's the part of me that the way I play like sometimes I, it's not like I want to score all the time but my game is kind of like similar to him he he always wants to be 
you know, to help the team to do something, you know, always want to create something and help the team grow. So I think that's one thing that I, I think from him. And he's just, in general, he's just a, that kind of player that, you know, if, I, I think every coach would want to have that him in their team. He's just really smart and amazing on the field. So, yeah. Yeah, no, he's he's a genius, a footballing genius, absolutely. You've been told no and, and denied so many opportunities in the NWSL, and then you break through. Where does your strong mentality and mindset come from? I think for me, my mentality comes from... Uh, it's more like wanted it more than anything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... Sometimes you might want something, then then a few months later, it's like, oh, I don't want it anymore because of the whatever comes on the way. But I think for me, wanted it made me want to go so hard. It's like I wanted to give everything I have, you know. If that's the only thing that I had to focus on in my life, give up on a lot of things, I think, yeah, I said to myself, yeah, I would do it because it was doing that. And it wasn't easy. It was just different Things that happened, and I had to keep reminding myself this is what I wanted, you know. So if I, I don't think if I didn't want it so bad, I would be able to, you know, get to this point at all. But I wanted it so bad, it was just the reason why, you know, I kept going and I didn't want to give up. So would you say that was going through your mind when you showed up at the open tryout for Sky Blue? Like, were you nervous too? How were you feeling in that moment when you first got there? Yeah. I think, yeah, uh, for me, going in, I want to, to try out, definitely. So going in, the first thing comes to my mind is the reason I'm there. I want this. I want this so bad. So then I look at the, you know, the never side of it. And first of all, I, I was just doing trial with different people. It wasn't like the first team, so with the Sky Blue. So it was like, it was nervous because all of the players, pretty much most of them are from D1 schools. We've had a uh, great experience with, you know, the intensity and all that environment. But for me, I went to a Division two school, and we were pretty good. And I went through different phrases, so I was like, little nervous, but also I was like ready because I've been waiting for so long for this, and I've kind of like prepare myself for this moment. So I was ready for whatever is going to happen. You know, I was nervous, but I kind of put it out aside. You know, the moment I step on the field, I don't think about anything. I, all I want to do is play, you know, have fun, be happy, and then deliver what, you know, whatever tasks that I, I'm there to do, I want to do it. So that's what I was going through my head, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're you're now a breakout star. You know, the, the Challenge Cup was a time for you to really show what you can do. And now that you're getting more attention, how do you deal with the stardom and the added attention that you've been getting? Um, so some people say it's good it, because you, because as a player you want to be seen you want people to know what you do and all that but uh, also it, it's hard to maintain that but it only comes when you are you know you focus and you always remember yourself who you are and you know where you come from and the reason why you do it because if you don't remember all that you have you know kind of change your direction too because everybody likes you and then all that and it, it might change your focus but for me it's good, but also I kind of uh, always remind myself who I am and where I came from and how I got here. So that's all one thing that keeps me you know, always on my toe and makes me not you know, fall out or makes me not kind of like, you know, just enjoy that. Oh, okay, I, I did this. That's all it's going to be now. So I think I'm always aware of what is around me and what I have to do and always not to forget where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. and. You created so many chances. Your your passing accuracy during the cup was fantastic. But what are some of the other things you feel like you can add to your game to kind of benefit the team even more? Oh, yeah. There's, for me, there's so much about me. And I think maybe as time goes on, I will do that for my team. And, you know, I think most of my players, yeah, they still got a lot that we shown. We didn't have enough time to, you know, prepare for this tournament. But um, I, for me as a player, I'm kind of like, different type of play. I'm not just like all dribbler or, you know, all defensive play. I'm just like all that. And like I said, it depends on the game. If I'm, if I'm playing attacking or defensive or anywhere, that's when I can show more. But I know my attacking side will show because not many people saw that from me. So I think maybe whatever that comes on my way, I'm 
going to definitely do that and people will see the attack inside of me, the skill sets and the mindset that I have, you know, on the game. So definitely they will see that, yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you score your first NWSL goal coming up this season, do you have any special celebration planned? Have you thought it through at all? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do definitely have one. But I can tell you, though. Okay. In, in, in the future, it can happen. Uh-huh. I do have a celebration goal that um, I thought I was going to score, but and then do it, but I didn't. But um, I do want to do that for sure. So hopefully, you know, that game comes true, too, and then I'll be able to... Do that celebration. Cool. So it'll be a surprise. We just got to stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Now, you're the only player from Ghana in the NWSL right now. What does it mean to you to be representing your country on a stage like this? It's it's a great, you know, great privilege for me to represent my country. And it's, like, it's one of the best in the world, you know. And it's not just any league that, uh, you know, you can just... You, you know, show up and then already you, you're making a name for yourself. It's not, it all comes with hard work and, you know, uh, help from your teammates, you know, your, your coaches and all. So for me, um, I'm just grateful that I could be that person that's representing my country and hopefully, you know, keep going. And in the future, a lot of people can also do that. But for now, I would say I'm just happy that I'm, I'm that kind of player and and I'm going to keep working hard and make sure that I keep I maintain a name for my country. Yeah, That's great. And last question, what advice do you have for young girls, not only in Ghana, but around the world, who are looking to chase their dreams? So for me, any young player that is watching me or listening to me now, or maybe will listen, I want them to know you don't have to always play a better team. You know, the best team to be the best player. Um, that you might play the best team and then you'll get better. But sometimes being in a younger team or like in a team that they're not great, it's just a stepping stone. You know, you could be the best player in that team, but also it helps you to you know, appreciate a lot of things, different things that you will not get when you play in the top team. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I want all these young players to focus on getting better, focus on improving as a person and as a player and as a team player and not just focusing on, oh, I want to be in the best team. You know, just be there. No, you have to make sure when you go in there, you just want to make an impact and do something that, you know, will help the team, not just be there. So, but then I'll say you need to work harder always and not just like working hard. You know, you have to know what exactly you put in the, the work in, work on your weakness a lot and, Surround yourself with good people, you know. Listen to people that is the best in you. Whether they tell you the negative or the positive side, you don't need to take it. You don't have to think that, you know, they don't like you or anything because those are the people that are going to be honest with you, you know. So for them, I want them to be focused and they help these, you know, be able to, uh, you know, receive, you know, comments and feedbacks and then turn that into, you know, a good thing. So that's definitely what I can say. Again, that was Jennifer Cujo of Sky Blue FC. Again, you want to talk about never giving up on your dreams, no matter who or where you are from. As long as you are mentally willing to go as far as no one else is willing to go, you can achieve what you want to achieve. That's the bottom line. That's what you can learn from someone like Jennifer Cujo, who literally just wanted it more than everyone else. There are plenty of players, I'm sure, who are sitting at home who would love to be in the NWSL, but are you willing to make the necessary sacrifices? She got off her couch, showed up to that tryout, right, and impressed everyone, just ready, waiting for her opportunity. And that's exactly what she did. And I think it's awesome. Her idol is Kaka, and you can definitely see the influence in her play in terms of her ability to distribute and pass That was by far her greatest quality during the Challenge Cup and something we're going to get to see more of now within the next week or so as we have this fall series. So again, very excited to have more soccer coming back and more Jennifer Cujo because she was an incredible story and inspiration and we were just very fortunate to have her on. We hope you guys really enjoyed that interview. All right, we have covered everything in America. Now we're going to head over to Europe. The FA Women's Super League is back, y'all, and it is going to be back with a bang. Let me tell you. Oh my goodness. 
You want to talk about some big signings, the profile of the league elevating even more. Sam Uis and Rose Lavelle are going to Manchester City. They clearly were not going to sit by idle and watch as Chelsea continue to add star players to their roster. They're going to add Pernille Harder of Wolfsburg. Arsenal is pretty much set. They look good. So we've had those three teams. The big news, the big, big news that I am very, very happy about as a Manchester United fan is Kristen Press and Tobin Heath. Are you kidding me? Now we're talking about a top four, just like in the Premier League. We're talking about Manchester United being in the title mix now, if they can sign those two players. Then you have Chelsea with Sam Kerr and that whole group of star power, Bethany England. Fran Kirby, the list goes on and on over at Chelsea. Arsenal, you have Vivian Miedema and all of those great players. Then you have Manchester City, who are already have amazing players like Jill Scott, Ellen White. And now you add a Sam Uis, you add a Rose Lavelle. This FAWSL season is going to be amazing. And it's great for their league because of the amount of exposure and attention they are going to get. They are going to put everything into that, and it's going to get the recognition it deserves. I think we can't be too worried about whether we're going to lose our star players for a long period of time. They need this experience for themselves, and it is critical. They will be back. I don't think this is... It's not like Rose is never going to play in the NWSL again, all right? It's not It's not going to be like that. They will be back. We've seen this many times before. I wouldn't be too worried, but... Again, this is great for the Women's Super League, and we can't wait to see how it continues to grow, develop, and hopefully expand. And and hopefully we have more teams added into the mix. To start off the season, Chelsea got their first trophy, defeating Manchester City 2-0. I believe you had Millie Bright get on the score sheet. And again, another, another trophy for Chelsea. So a good start to the season, and we will see how... Again, it plays out very, very excited for it. So keep it locked. We're going to have plenty of top five goals. We're going to be monitoring the league and be constantly updating you on what's going on, for sure. Two more things to get you updated on before we wrap up the show today. First, Lyon are champions of Europe once again. They just wrapped up a 3-1 win over Wolfsburg. Wolfsburg's arch nemesis is Lyon. They can't seem to beat them in this final game for whatever reason. They've been here many times before. Lyon has won their fifth straight Champions League title with seven overall. It goes to show when you just invest money, if you are a big team willing to invest the money, this is what you can create to invest so early on like they did when the women's game wasn't nearly as what it is now, seven, eight years ago. Leona are a testament to that level of dominance. It is absurd. Seven Champions League titles. Players like Som- Somer, Buhari, Madri, Renard get seven Champions League titles. That is absurd. Last and most important point, Deloy Hansen's comments this week obviously were shocking to a lot of people. Actually, not even shocking because I think it's been known to people who work close to him and the team that he is a racist. He's been a racist. And now he's going to be selling both Real Salt Lake and the Royals. Big, big news. I also saw J.J. Watt, um, Kalia Watt's husband, tweet out that he's interested in buying the team. Him, Josie Altador, that would be a crazy ownership group. Are you kidding me? That would be insane if those two could get together and, and find a way to work this out. But yeah, Deloy Hansen, good riddance. Utah has had incidents in the past, right? There was a Dizzle who had to deal with a bit of racism at that game. And then also, even in the NBA, I've mentioned this before, Russell Westbrook got into it with a fan in Utah for making some suspicious comments. And then he was banned for life. And I believe that fan who was caught in the Portland-Utah match in the NWSL was also banned for life. So, Again, good riddance, Deloy Hansen. We will not miss you one bit. All right, that is it for episode 35 of Give and Go. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Again, you can get this podcast on iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, everywhere. And again, for more information, go to www.girlssoccernetwork.com, Instagram, Girls Soccer Network, Twitter, at Girls Soccer Net. We have a YouTube channel. We are everywhere. Again, be sure to check us out. 
Thank you guys for tuning in. We will be back soon. Take care, guys. Peace.